I feel comfortable just saying this. It may not even be so much about the sickness. It may be about the orientation that God's asked of everyone now in the new in the new time. You know, so it's, it's like, like a little like a mini, a little mini apocalypse. It's yeah, just, like... just being just being aware in a way that you know you weren't aware before. You know, being aware of this is an opportunity for repentance. This is an opportunity. You know, this is for my sins. This is for my my salvation. Like re- and really believing it. And I think just having that actual disposition versus like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's, I'm supposed to think, but I'm not really going to do anything about it. You're different. This is is an ancient disposition though, really actually like this is, this is more in line with how ancient people would view illness. It's holistic, right? I mean, it's not just your body. It's like, Mm -hmm. well, because it isn't. No, right. It it isn't, and th- this was this was like one of my early introductions to. Do wait. Do you want to do the intro? I feel like we're already <laughs> in the show. Yeah. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and that's Father Turbo, and that's Cyprian. And tonight, I'm going to ask them, what hill are you willing to die on in general? What's something that you're like, no, I don't care. This is my view on this thing, and I stick with it. Like, you know, it could be about anything. So the example I would give, mine, because I know it's kind of a broad question, but uh, is I think Aquaman is awesome. And that's that's my hill I will die on. I'll defend that. That is, to a, anyone. That is a serious hill to die on right there. Because he is you are the, the king vast of the minority. He is the king of the ocean. He's Arthurian legend. His name is literally Arthur. And he he wields a mystical weapon that gives him control of the ocean or control of the life within the ocean. And he's 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 underplayed and laughed at because of a, a show from the 70s. Super Friends. But he is an awesome, awesome superhero, and I think he's awesome. I so. mean, he'd be awesome if he was here, like in Saipan. Like he would, he would be killing it. He'd be the perfect superhero <laughs> for this place. Yeah, because there's yeah. there's there's ocean everywhere. Yeah, no, never I'm never far from the ocean. He like he's king of two thirds of the world. I'm just saying, like That's he's fair. king of two thirds of the world. So he's awesome. And Atlantis, Atlantean, Atlantean legend is awesome, um, and. I love his supporting characters. I think he's a great guy. So he's, I would put probably right behind Batman and Superman, probably my favorite DC hero of all time. So, uh, how do you feel about the, um, the, uh, Mesoamerican backstory that they gave to Namor for, uh, Wakanda forever? It's, how do you feel uh, about it's, that? it's a way of doing that. That's cool. I mean, it, it fleshed him out in some ways that, maybe wouldn't have fleshed him out in some other ways. I think it's cool. Mm-hmm. Like I dig it. I think that I, I um, agree. I was actually like, wow, they, they, this is the one time that they're, that they're, that they're shot at wokeness. Actually. Like it actually it made sense. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Like I, I love Namor. I'll just say this before father starts. I love Namor. That's not necessarily my Namor. Like that's not the name where right, I read right. in comics. Yes, fair enough. But my whole thing is doesn't need to be faithful to the comics as long as it's good. If it's good, mm-hmm. I don't really mm-hmm. care. Mm-hmm. It's just another interpretation of them. It's not a big mm-hmm. deal. But father, sorry. What say you, father? No, I just um I think we talked about this, but I remember like Tim Cast, you know, Tim Pool did a whole thing trying to roast it, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there was all these people trying to roast roast it, you know. And, you're talking um, about Wakanda forever? Yeah. And I was like, ah, you know, and that's how I knew. Well, I'm already, I already knew it, but it was one of those kind of proof in the pudding of it goes both ways. People just get caught up in the meme, both sides. Cause like, mm-hmm. like, oh, it's just woke garbage. I'm like, anyone who said that, I'm like, ah, like you, you never, you never read the comics because that, that whole storyline 
that happened. That happened long before there's woke stuff going yeah. on. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it worked. And I, I'm a huge, like the way you feel about Aquaman is the way I feel about Namor. I mean, Namor is like in my top. He's top great. Five. He's a um, really great, great. I love yeah, Namor. Sure. I've loved Namor since I was a kid. Uh, I still, my, my oldest comics I own to this day are uh, Submariner one and two. Wow. Oh, I, snap. I, I still own them. And nice. I love Namor and I took it. I mean, the boys went and saw him and they grew up loving Namor and we all lost our stuff when he's flying around and everything. They did a great job with him. So the little wings, they did the little yeah. wings. Like, mm-hmm. oh, it's, yeah. you know, the only thing I'm going to say is the only thing where I was just like, it was a really, really, really major disappointment. And I'm also very thankful you know, I don't want to make too much of it, but I always wondered why did I wait so long to see um, Aquaman? Mm. And I'm yes. so glad I waited. Such a good they, movie. Because if I had a saw Aquaman's a great movie, if I had saw Aquaman before Wakanda, I'd have been upset. Oh, because, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, the water that. effects in Wakanda are so bad in comparison. Because the water effects in Aquaman are incredible. It's that's a. Uh... They're but incredible. I, I think Those they're trying to do something though. Floating and just like, oh, oh, I think sounds... they're trying to. I think they're trying to do a. I, I I noticed that too. This was something that I noticed, but I think I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I feel like because they're doing a Mexican thing, that they're trying to do like a Mexican magical realism thing that's happening there, and it's trying to be more ethereal with the, with the water. You know what I mean? Oh, rather so than it's, like realistic. It's like interpreted I mean, rather. I mean, Cyprian, yes. I'll give it to you. I, I don't, I mean, I think you're being super charitable. <laughs> I was going to say. Just, I just, given... it was just busted. I mean, there the water effects were, and again, I really wouldn't have said anything because I, I didn't notice it, but then I watched Aquaman mm. with my, with my, my uh, little ones like two weeks later, just because I was on a name work kick. And I was like, what in the world? Like, how does this even happen? You have, like, way more of a budget than they do. And on yeah. top of that, like, that movie came out years after Aquaman. Yeah. Yeah. A couple years at least. You would think you just up the game, but it's just like, ooh, it's, it was just bad. Yeah. It was like, but other than that, it was uh, I, it was good. You know, well, what's, th- the, what's your hill, father? Real quick, I just have to say this about Namor. This is my one thing I'd say. I love Namor's original costume, just the trunks, like mm-hmm. just yeah. the green and, and the and they pulled it off with the scales. Yeah, the ultimate power move by Namor is him sitting on the throne, and just that with his legs like fully spread, like like the yeah. king stands with just yeah, like his that, leg, yeah, like yeah, 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 that yeah, is yeah. the power move. Like yeah, I'm yeah. like you, you know, you are a king. When you can mm-hmm. do that and people still bow and scrape before you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, Father, what's your hill? Sorry. I mean, because it's not a serious one, right? It doesn't matter. No. <laughs> okay. Because I'm like, I'll give you all kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. I. I you, love, I'm... you love Man of Steel. Oh, I love Man of Steel. I thought Man of Steel was great. All my kids thought Man of Steel was great. Loved it. Uh, Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know. I'll throw one out there. I'll I'll die on this hill. I'll fight anybody, anytime, anywhere. They can bring weapons. I'll go, I'll go bare knuckle with them. Uh, In and out fries are just terrible. I'll say it. See, it's funny because the hill I was going to die on was that they're good. (laughs) That was actually going to be my hill because I we just I just had that conversation with a whole bunch of people. I cannot. This is is like a this is like a like a Rocky Creed moment where it's like we want to fight each other, we love each other, but we don't want to fight each other. This is like Sean Evans and John Jones. Like ah, I don't want to fight. You know what I mean? We're from the same. I ordered. I ordered two. Orders of fries at In and Out. I Two love orders. You, Korean, but, you know, I mean, and I get them to, as cheese fries. I have what? a melted cheese on the top of the fries. So, <laughs> what I mean, kind of fries I mean, are listen, they? Listen, listen. Good I, magical fries. Are they crinkle a, cut? I mean, are they like? No, they're just like straight. They're just like they take the potato and they just do a straight. They're thin. So it's, they're okay. Thin. Okay, so we're like, like, kind of like Wendy's or Burger King fries. Or no. Like, 
No. No. Okay. They're unique. I'm... They're unique. You, no. you, uh, yeah, they're unique. Can you I'm imagine, Google it. imagine imagine a potato that's cut poorly, cooked poorly, not seas- seasoned poorly. Oh, I love the seasoning. Um, it It's just like the worst. For, it's like, you know what it is? Isn't the seasoning just salt, though, Father? There's it's no seasoning. Salt. That's, yeah, what, they don't put That's what I like about there's it. Not, there's not even salt. salt. There's not even salt on it. You always have to get an extra pack of the little well, tube. Well, they do the, give you an, they give you a little tube of salt. You know the, right. the pontoon right. salt? The pontoon yeah. boat exactly. salt thing? Yes. You know what yes, I mean? Yes, it, yes. It's a little tube. Yeah. You know These look is? exactly like Wendy's and Burger King fries. No, 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 no. They no, don't no, taste no. like Wendy's. Nothing. They don't no. taste, Wendy's but that's what I'm saying. Wendy's has better fries. I'll take a I'll take a Biggie fries over in uh, in there. Let me say something. I mean, I like Wendy's fries. It's Wendy's fries got good fries. Yeah. It's it's if it, if little Louise as right now, how old is she? She's four and a half. Little Louise said, Daddy, I love you. I'm going to do something nice for you. I made you fries. Made fries. <laughs> and you had to eat them because. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Enough said on that. Yeah. I love right. I love them. I love them. I don't know why this conversation came up in like my in in my circle just the other day. Just the other day. I think and and what we came to about it is in and out in and out has a distinct taste. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of people who did not grow up in Southern California, they eat they they all Southern Californians go nuts about in and out. Right. Like for people who don't know, like they put these in and outs like right next to the airport because so many people when they're the first thing when they come back to California after they've been gone for a long time, they're like, I want to eat in and out. They got and, they got good burgers, Walt. Isn't that from well, the Big Lebowski it, is they got yes. good burgers, Walt. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. it's but I think I think it may very well be that that unique taste engenders nostalgia. Mm-hmm. And their brand is also a nostalgic mm-hmm. brand mm-hmm. where it's like they have the original colors of like the original Southern California style. They mm-hmm. they still have a lot of locations where you can't eat inside mm-hmm. that are only drive through. Mm-hmm. Right. And, or you can walk up to the window and eat outside on like picnic tables in the original style. And so I think particularly for people of like our generation, when it was really like at that time, you could definitely not eat inside in and out mm-hmm. Like when I was growing up as a kid, if you got in and out there was no inside dining. That's like in the last 20 years. That, there's something about that taste of like the fries, the shake, the lemonade, That's and the shake. burger. Yeah, yeah. And it just... They see the simplicity. I mean, here's the thing. The simplicity, and I think that's what people get with the fries. But man, I just... Like I'll eat, let me let me just I guess I'm not dying on that hill right let me just walk <laughs> let me just walk something back just one thing it's okay if you sit down on the hill I'll though. sit down the hill <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna say like if I because I've I've graduated I mean of course yeah I've I've graduated meaning I think I was in Austin a couple of like two years oh, ago Whataburger no oh no. No, no Whataburger is pretty good. It's no, not it's fantastic. Not. I but I feel like Whataburger is for Texans. Sure. But In-N-Out is for but see, but For me, yeah. Whataburger is like, do you remember they can't do that? You can't do that on television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Remember that that stinky chef? Yeah. Remember that gross chef that would make a like, yeah, the gross really, chef like someone sat on it? That's yeah, Whataburger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, but yeah, it is. <laughs> the, the thing is, here's the thing. Like, I at one point, I hadn't had In-N-Out probably about a year or so at this point. And I was there, I was in Austin, Texas, visiting my friend, Father Moses, and I had the option. I was like, oh, there's an in and out right there, and there's a Five Guys. We have Five Guys here oh, in Missouri. Oh, Five Guys. Five Guys in Missouri. Yeah. And, like, I was just, you know what? I'm hungry. And I know that in and out is good, but he, this is, to your point, the nostalgia. It was like, yeah, this is, if I go to in and out it's going to be good, but it's nostalgia points. Yes, I'm exactly. going. I'm going to go. I went to Five Guys. I went home. I told my family they wanted to like skin me alive and, and like lynch me. They're like, mm-hmm. "Oh, you're a traitor! I can't believe you actually did that." Dad. Mm-hmm. Now, that being said, I've graduated, meaning I found my combination, which is I just skip the fries. I go for the. I go for two double doubles. I just two fix, double doubles. Yeah, I, I skip the fries. If I was gonna have them, I would just. Here is the thing I've been doing. If I ever have them, I just got got to get them well done, like extra well done. Cause oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, the well done fries, just, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's like eating a roach, like <laughs> like roach larva. Excuse me, 
Because at least the roach would have some crunch to it. The larva is just <laughs> roach larva is what an In and Out fry is. It's roach well, larva. I won't. I won't eat In and Out outside of California. Yeah, for it's, that I don't, exact they don't exist. I'll, I'll just. I'll just, well. Vegas. When I lived yes, in Vegas, let me they take it back. It Texas, there. Texas, they have yeah. it That's Texas. Right. They've got them. But when I see it there, I'm like, eh, no, yeah. no, because this, because I think it's just, it's, I think it's the nostalgia. Yeah, I think it's the nostalgia. It's a, which, it's a good piece of it. Which actually is a tie-in, right? Well, so actually, it, I have a funny story, ahead. really quick. I was Please. talking to two brothers from the church, and one of them was talking about how he had to go back to California, mm. and um. So uh, the one who's going back to California says, oh, I was talking to him. I was like, oh, you're looking forward to going back. He's like, no, every time I go there, I just try and get in and out. Mm-hmm. And my friend and my other friend was like, oh, I heard they have good burgers. <laughs> like, I don't know. It was just like this whole like totally <laughs> organic moment. He didn't even mean it. But he was just like, oh, I heard they got good burgers. And the dude was like, no, I'm just trying to get in and out of California. Like, I just getting in. I'm just getting. The oh, I got you. Oh, yeah. now I get yeah. it. Wow. Yeah. And it was totally organic. And the guy that said that, oh, I heard they got good burgers. He's a, he, I love him. He's great, but he's kind of a little bit of a troll. So I didn't know if he was being serious for a second or not, but I was like, whatever, I'll give it to you. Yo, like the timing on troll, that, was, that's perfect. That was quick. I was like, even if it wasn't, it was like, it was quick. And I was like, oh, that's pretty good. Like not, mm-hmm. there are, I, I'm a comedy. I'm a dude who loves a good comedy. And they're probably like. I would say less than 10 people in the world who genuinely make me laugh. And I don't life laugh out of like politeness mm. that dude I was talking about, the guy who said the, Oh, I heard they got good burgers that, uh, that dude makes me laugh quite often. He makes me laugh pretty frequently. So it's all about timing. That's the thing it's is, and timing. his timing is perfect. We were making some joke about the, who's, um, Corbett, I think, who is that? The, is that the announcer guy? The, um, the commentator, uh, yeah, Corbett Report. He like, I guess sometimes he like busts out his guitar and starts singing or something like that. I don't know. I've never seen it, but like he's like written some music and they're all making That's Corbett. Of... Cor- no, Stephen, not, not, Stephen not Stephen Corbett. Not, not the Corbett Report. Corbett Report. The podcaster. The podcaster. James Corbett. James Corbett. Thank you. Okay. Busts out his guitar every okay. once in a while. He does. And, yeah, I guess. I don't he's know. He's got one in the back background. I've of never his, seen him uh, bust it out. His but show. I mean, I've never I have never that. either, but I've heard people talk about it. And one time we were all sitting around talking about how he'd start playing Wonderwall by Oasis. Mm. And then we were sitting around and we were like singing it or whatever. And then where were you? And then this dude that I mentioned before, his name's Jesse, popped in and said, when, when, where were you when the towers fall? Oh, and I was like, just like yeah. right away, just boom. like boom, right in there. And I was like, I, I was like eating something like snorted out of my nose. Like I was like, that was awesome. Like that was absolutely brilliant. But anyway, yeah, yeah his, his laughter made me, he made me laugh so hard. I got sick. So <laughs> there you go. That's the transition. We're going to talk about being sick. Well, we were talking about the spiritual, the holistic, like spiritual aspect uh, of sickness. And I think that this is something like, I don't get, I don't, really get sick very often and i haven't gotten sick very often since like because one of my early exposures to to kind of like i don't know if you want to call it new age or esoterica or whatever when i was relatively young was reiki i don't know if you guys know no no reiki like it's this mm-hmm. japanese kind of like hands-on healing and they use but it was more the principle that was the first time that it had really been introduced to me that like Oh yeah, there's a spiritual component to illness. Mm-hmm. Like it when it be, when it was made very real to me that there's a spiritual component to illness, and like you're not gonna get cured if you don't deal with the 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 non material aspect of what's happening with you. Like if you don't deal with that, if you don't address that, you won't get healed. And sometimes if that can be addressed, that's all you need to be healed. Yeah, I mean the the thing is that's really everyone except us. I mean, basically, enlightenment, post enlightenment, Western man, whether you're Christian or not, that's our that's our perspective, and it's great mm-hmm. because one of the things that's been needing to happen, and I think this is one of the many, 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 many fruits. Obviously, besides like salvation, right? But mm-hmm. one of the many fruits of people being exposed to orthodoxy now and being exposed really to um, orthodoxy in the sense of you know, the tradition, the deep tradition of the church, 
I mean, the forget, like, make sure you guys pull me back on this one, but um, because I'm going to digress into a rabbit hole real quick. But like, when I came into the church in the early, uh, early mid 2000s, like, a lot of the, the tradition of the church is just buried. You know, there was a very much, um, there wasn't like a lot of the um, elevator pitch yet, you know, like it was there in regards of like history and things like that. But later on, you know, being in the church, I saw that kind of develop where it was just like people were coming in more and more for specific reasons. But the tradition of the churches was really, really buried. What I mean by that is, the holistic therapeutic aspect of like what the church is really about versus just, Oh, this is the more classic historical flavor of Christianity, which is what a lot of people came into um, when they became Orthodox. And then they languish in there for years until another crisis hits. Then it's like they either kind of like die and just end up belly up like a fish. Uh, they're still in the water right mm. but they're belly up just you know what i mean if that makes sense sure versus going deeper and when you go deeper you find like oh, okay yeah there's a spiritual component there's a spiritual root to illness there's there's all these things that you maybe would have thought that's just new agey or that's just whatever and i think that's great because what people need to you know it, it's getting out of the materialist mindset that your faith can't and should not just be, it should not and can't just be some abstract kind of like idea that you have that you tack on to your life, right? I think what the this mm, generation that we're a part of right now, um, of people that are coming in, they're coming in with an awesome opportunity to discover what the church you know, and the, what the elders, the contemporary elders of the church teach about things like illness, mm. right? And so someone could just think, um, someone could look at like our show or maybe something else and just think, yeah, it's kind of fringy orthodox stuff, but it's not really. Um, I mean, the way we present it maybe is, but everything we're talking about is patristic and more particular, it's it's the it's like the it's the proper way of from my perspective of getting it into a patristic mindset or phronema because we've talked about it before but the leapfrogging you know the guy who comes in and he's just like oh i just read maximus i'm like ah, i don't yeah. you know sure. i love maximus don't get me wrong but like i don't really want to hear from that guy because if you're not if you don't know uh, you know elderly you know saint yakovos of evia if you don't know saint porfirio if you don't know saint sophroni you know if you don't know elder cleopa like if you don't know these elders and what they're bringing to us, which is salvation and which is the, 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 the means of union with Christ for the whole man, then like you're, you're very susceptible to distorting Maximus and, and just coming back around to having this thing turn you into Krang to where you're just a giant brain with no heart and no body. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But I mean, isn't this even more true about, uh, about the Bible? Isn't this even more true about like Holy, whole, the oldest of Holy scripture? Yes. Like it, the further back we go, I, it it was a uh, priest monk, uh, Cosmos, Cosmos who, yeah. who's, who said, uh, if you read the Bible, but you don't read the lives of the saints, you become a heretic. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 That and that that I that had never thought that had never occurred to me. But I obviously I I run into because of my line of work uh, working in a Christian organization, a lot of solo scriptura guys. And you run into this like immediately. I was like, okay, there wasn't a canonical Bible. Father, correct me if I'm wrong, but for like the first 250 years. And like, right. and so what were, no, you, there was scripture, there was the gospels, and people read them at church, but you couldn't just go buy a Bible. So, like, what did you do? You talked to your spiritual father, you lived the gospel, you paid attention to the people being martyred around you. That's how you. Like that's how you've lived out the gospel. So that whole mindset, that whole, it, I mean, Father Cosmos has said, like, I don't even think I could name all 12 disciples. And I was just like, yeah, I don't think I could either. Like, I don't know if I could name all 12 of them, but like at the well, same time. Well, the great time, thing is you don't need to. 
That's right? that's kind of and the wonderful that's, thing. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. That, and that's the thing with Protestantism is that they couldn't either, but they set you up in the sense to where they make it seem like you have to know X, Y, and Z in order to encounter Christ to be saved. It's like you've got to prove you got you've got to prove it to them and to some other kind of like um, arbitrary litmus, you know. But but what's interesting about that is is there's still a longing for the grace of God that heals and transforms. But and this is this goes to show you the hypocrisy because one of the fruits of one of the fruits of pride is hypocrisy, and Protestantism is essentially pride. And the fruit of that pride is hypocrisy because they long for that healing, they long for those things, but it's like they accuse they accuse the Catholic faith of just making stuff up, traditions of men, but they end up being truly the ones who are like consumed by the traditions of men because the the approach of the church is always Christ-centered, right? So healing is always Christ-centered. Your your illness is always allowed to you. Um, yes, because the world has fallen and therefore our biology, you know, is fallen, but it's allowed to you for your repentance. It's allowed to you for your fuel for you to pursue Christ, you know? The orientation is just, it's different. It's a different orientation versus an orientation that's fundamentally materialist slash, you know, kind of like deist, secular, you know? And, and sickness and how you view sickness is one of the greatest ways to really distinguish whether someone's really approaching an orthodox mindset, phronema, or not. And this is one of those areas too where... um you you do look and see like quote unquote cradles how there is something to be said for just being raised in an orthodox culture yeah because they will have an orthodox mindset even if they don't really know much about the faith right it's just their worldview and their experience of things like illness is orthodox mm -hmm. just because it's the that's what the culture was was raised in you know what i mean I was I I was having this. It's so wild that you. It's not wild that you bring that up because this happens all the time, right? So I was just having this thought today regarding my wife, right? Being Russian, and one of the things, I I, I had a conversation with somebody, who uh, very well-meaning individual. I think probably very aligned, like probably politically, maybe spiritually. I don't know, but somebody who was inquiring about like coming and living in Saipan. And, you know, as they started talking to me about their, their, you know, needs, let's say, like their needs and concerns, it was very like what I would describe as like high maintenance, right? It's the kind of thing where it's like, everybody's got allergies. What about gluten free? Can we get oh, away? We're wow. EMF sensitive or this, you know, and it's just like, there's... <clears throat> I, you, you wonder and like it's it's interesting because like people let's say uh generation x and older it's like things like nut allergies you know like i think growing up i knew one kid mm -hmm. one kid right i'm 45 i knew one kid who had a nut allergy one and in that i went to school with and it was like serious where like if this like it would kill him and it was one of these things where it's like okay now it's like 30 percent of kids but yet it's like you know i asked my wife about russia she's like that people don't have nut allergies there and it's like wait a minute i know someone who's gluten sensitive and in greece bread never bothered them like they went over to greece and they ate all the stuff and it never yeah, bothered. We'll, see here. well hold on we're, we're this is gonna <laughs> take us into an interesting place right but this is the thing like we modified our grain here a long time ago in ways that Europe hasn't. Yeah. Right. So that, but that, here's the thing. Let's but not, it's both and. It's both yes, and. It's yes, not, it's not either or. It's both and. Sure. Let's not look at that in a, in a just like some sort of exclusively materialist lens either. Right. Why did we, why, why, we doing I, that why did we do it? Why did, why we, did do we do it? it? Like, why did we do that? You know? And so, mm -hmm. like, some people have argued just that alone has perpetuated all of these kind of cascading um, autoimmune deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, it's like little, it's little 
little drops of AIDS just kind of like mm -hmm, growing mm -hmm. and growing and growing. Um, and so there's something to be said for that. And there's something to be said for this is this is interesting, too, because even in the in the regard of like, um, you know, I had somebody, you know, God bless them, whatever it is, what it is. But, you know, I, I had somebody I think definitely this person decide to sever themselves from me because, you know, I would too, if, if I was them, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, okay. I apologize, kind of, not really, but I apologize. There's somebody out here, this is going to cut you. Forgive me. But, you know, pharma is one of those industries where I'm like, like me personally, and and I I get it. Some people would say, well, you know, what if it's your your livelihood and, and all these sure. things? But um, pharma is one of those things where I'm like, ah, I would I would it'd be really hard for me to work in big pharma. It's so shady, a, man. It's, it's just so, so... It's evil, you know what I mean, and like what am I talking about it just it gets back to big pharma is this kind of perfect example it's like the kind of inverted evil icon of what we're talking about in regards of the fallen materialist demonic approach to the world to what human beings are you know this this completely profit driven corrupted you know what I mean like there's someone goes like but it saves lives I'm like does it does it does it really save lives? Well, well, you guys, do you guys know about this? I only discovered in pharma the last Kia? few years. You know what I mean? When it, when like it, when it comes to pharma, pharma do you guys, do you guys know about how prevalent the placebo effect is in pharmaceutical trials? Pretty, like most people, I've heard this before. I heard it's like, like if people understood how prevalent it was, there'd be like a revolution. Like people would be a revolution if they understood. Like, hold on, you've been fleecing us this whole yeah, time. Yeah, just it's like. So first off, in every trial, they assume that it will happen. It's so heavily assumed that in order to do trials, you have to account for it. So basically, they have to alter the numbers in the, tri in the trial because otherwise, every single trial will be invalid because the placebo effect is so high. It's usually something like in pharmaceutical trials, it's usually something like 15%, but there are trials where it has been as high as 30%. In other words, one third of the people given a sugar pill were cured in the exact same way that the people who were given the actual pill were cured. Well, then you have to say, well, how many of the people who were given the actual pill were, <laughs> cured were also cured by not the pill, but by whatever cured the other people? And then you start to say to yourself, well, wait a second. We're studying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really, what we should be studying is why did the sugar pill work to cure yeah. this for 30% of people? Because a sugar pill is way cheaper. But you're not going to make any money off of that yet. Yes. That's the problem. Oh, yeah. Here's the thing. Yet. Because the time is coming very soon. Mm -hmm. The time is coming very soon. We'll be able to monetize that. We'll be able to. Well, I think it already happened, didn't it? it yeah. It, it, just ha it just happened. <laughs> if you can force people to take it, right? That's right. Did That's you guys, right. real quick. I'm sorry. Did you guys see the Woody Harrelson SNL monologue? The, I, I I did. I did. Father, it's perfect seen, the way he set it up. Perfect. Yeah. Have you seen this at all? Have you heard about it? Well, I heard a little bit about it, but we had a little bit of conversation. I'm just going to drop it first because, you know, what? okay, I, I saw a little bit of it and I was talking with a brother, a couple brothers, and I was like, something was off to me. Mm -hmm. And then later on, the, later on, the one brother... He was talking about like, you know, when he was dropping all kinds of signs, you know what I mean? Dropping signs. And then I was like, well, like, like what hands, hand signs, like hand with signs his hands? And, uh, and other signs. And then I was like, but he and I was and I was like, well, yeah, I mean, he's a herald. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's a herald. Right. And then because I'm like, you know, you got to discharge that. You got to discharge that karma. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. Woody Haroldson. <laughs> Haroldson. The, son of the Herald, yeah. right? And I mean, son so, of the Herald. Yeah. So we were we were joking around about, you know, he like they were doing their thing and he drew the short straw of like, okay, you're gonna you're gonna have to be the one that goes out there and discharges the the karma mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Um but like, yeah, so because the whole thing is like, oh, he's 
you know, he's like, how do you read him? But he's like an Elon character in the sense of, yes. look, man, these guys are on our, aren't on our side. They're mm-hmm. just, and I'll just throw this out there for people like, what are you guys talking about? So the idea, the concept is that these folks who are spiritually in line with the, the spiritual principles and powers, um, they operate on a system of basically a, a karmic discharge where I can do whatever I want to you, but in order to keep it from coming back to me, in order to keep it from affecting me, I have to like basically tell you out in the open. Think of it as like, you know, why does it's the, the contract villain- it's the contract with the devil it's in the, the cartoons contract. when the devil comes and he unrolls the entire contract? Right. So he has to show you that he has to he show, has to you, show everything. you everything that's there. Why does the villain have to start monologuing? You know, oh, you got me monologuing. You know what I mean? Why did, why does the villain have to monologue? Because he has to show everything. Right. And so this karmic discharge is like, we're going to tell people that we're going to poison them, kill them, do all these things, but we're going to do it in such a way, you know, through charm and entertainment and just dumbing them down that they'll just kind of accept it. They'll hit the click, I accept real quick, because they're not going to read everything that's in there. They just want the app. Hit accept, you know what I mean? But you accepted it, you signed it, right? And so it is going back to this deal, right? The crossroads, however you want to look at it. But why does all this matter? Someone's like, okay, roll your eyes. I'll tell you why. Because the principle that God created is that man has been endowed with free will. Every man's been endowed with free will. So how do you negate that? How how would the devil get in, get around in such a way to where he can negate the free will, which is a in essence a violation of the the not just violation in the sense of like like legal juridical, but violation as in like you know when someone's molested, they've been violated. Think of it that way too, a violation of this gift that God's given of the free will. So this car this karmic discharge that these um heralds have to kind of like announce to the world this gets us back to this balencia uh balenciaga baloney whole thing this like people are like why would they do this blah 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 well yeah part of it it's the game right that gets you back to um mick jagger and and the keith richards about you know sympathy for the devil you know the um the nature of the game, the confusion, right? So that's the nature of the game. Like that's part of it for sure. Disinformation, all stuff, whatever. But ultimately like that has to be laid out some way, somehow. And the more confusing, the more obscure. And sometimes the way to do that is just to make it right in your face. Mm -hmm. Right. Just saying, because you would never believe. And we know that works because think of all the people who for maybe like still are like, why would anyone do that? Why would somebody, you know what I mean? It's just kind of like, but people have been waking up, you know, slowly like, oh yeah, this is kind of weird, right? Um, this is why they would make it. This is why they would put it right in your face because I mean, they have to in order for them to. I mean, that's what Richard Ramirez did, the Night Stalker. He was like, they were like, well, why did you do it? The, well, the devil told me to. Mm-hmm. I mean, like he didn't say it exactly like that, but he was like, the devil told me to. And I, it, really quick i was just talking about like with this with a guy today who's a criminal an ex-criminal he's basically i forget what he said it's not covering tracks it's like he's it's something alluding to the fact of like covering yourself he's like i'm going to tell you exactly what i'm going to do to you and like and that is going to pacify you like mm-hmm. that's going to pacify you to the point where i can do what i want to you mm-hmm. like and i don't i don't think it's anything like well the like, unknown is what kills people so if you, it's almost, it's this weird twisting of inviting them into it to participate with it. Sure. And I mean, that was the most brilliant part of, yep. of non Dave Chappelle's <laughs> uh, yeah. dialogue, you know, uh, on, on uh, SNL, whatever, however long ago was like that point, that part where he's talking about Trump, how Trump went in, yeah, how Trump came out and said, look, this is what we're doing. How do I know? Because I'm part of the system. I'm part of it. I'm part of it. And then yeah. and then he's like, he walked right back in and kept doing it, you know? And so Dave Chappelle's doppelganger, when he threw that out there, it was like, yeah, you know, this is, this is, this is straight up the truth, you know? Well, that's the most powerful con, right? When con men talk about 
So what's the most, uh, how do you do a con, a confidence sc- scam, right? A confidence scheme. All, the, the most powerful ones, always the person who is actually being conned believes themselves to be in on the con. Mm. They believe themselves to be the one that's conning someone another mark, mm. right? And that it's actually that that's so that's this is not like Iceberg Slim says you can't con an honest man. Every con depends on the greed of the mark. So it's like the whole entire idea is you believe you're in on it. Mm-hmm. you believe that yeah. there's somebody else who's the victim, but it turns out that's not yeah. actually the mark. Mm-hmm. That's the accomplice. Well, let me stop you right there. Cause that's brilliant. I just want to kind of circle that back around. I remember having a conversation early on back in 20 and we were talking about, you know, it's like we're at that point where lines were starting to get drawn kind of early, you know, and the people who are like your neighbor and I don't want to get sick and blah, 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 whatever. And then those of us were like, ah, I don't know about this, you know? And I remember, and we're, you know, we're okay now. It's fine. But just, I got to bring it out. Cause it was a great point where this one brother who like took that line, whatever. And he, I remember even prior to that, and it's funny looking back on seeing how certain things were kind of like cooking in the, I mean, I was just, I'm just, I'm so naive. I just trust everybody. So like things are cooking in the water. And I remember him like zeroing in on conspiracy theories. This is early. And I was, and, you know, he was proto Facebook guy. He was really on there and, and into it. And I remember being like, not understanding where he was coming from on the, like, why are you picking like, why is conspiracy theories a thing all of a sudden? You know what I mean? And then it hit me right about the time before he, you know, he left um, our community, which was this. Uh, I can't remember who I was listening to, but it was um, it was somebody, and they said, you know, the thing is, the problem with a lot of people who struggle with truth, the hard truth of these demonic realities, um, you know, by George, it might have been you, Cyprian. I don't know, but. The thing is, they're scared. They can't admit that the life that they've bought into, the middle class life, no, my daughter is going to grow up in a good free world and like people mean well and everything's going to be OK. Like it, it's it's hard to admit that. So the person who who globs on to like, oh, the conspiracy theories, they're just, you know, this and that. That's the person who in many ways is dishonest because as a Christian, they know that the that your cosmology should be Satan is the prince of this world. Mm-hmm. Full stop. Now, God has allowed that. Sure. God has allowed everything. Sure. God's not the cause, but he's allowed it. And God ultimately wins, right? St. Paisios, if I didn't know the Lord would have the last word, I'd lose my mind. Sure. But drilling down a little bit, Satan is the prince of this world. And those of us who are expecting everything to work out good and just, you know, Christ is here to give us a white picket fence and all the things, it's like you want to maintain that that falsehood. Mm. Like, and and the 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 quote unquote, the quote unquote truth. Of the conspiracy theory is is looking to pop that bubble, and you can't have that bubble popped. Do you are you following yeah. what I'm saying? And that's dishonest. And that was kind of like one of the core things in regards of like how are we view it, getting back to the topic, how are we viewing sickness? Like it's it's much more comfortable for you to say, no, 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 you're you know, you're a snake handler, you're superstitious. Like, I don't believe in all that stuff about, like, the temple being holy or this or that. It's like, yeah, because if that's the case, then you're called to live in a fairly radical way that you're not living. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. if if everything is as we say it is, then that means that you have to live in such a way that what you, hey, we're all human beings, but what you are desiring, what you find comfortable is actually probably wrong. And you're now look, look you're now looking to die on that hill of like, no, I need to preserve this 
narrative of, you know, who's the <laughs> what I've invested in is good. Are you guys following what I'm saying? Who's the character from the Matrix that betrays everyone? Cipher. Yeah. Cipher. It's but Cipher. You're like, he wants to get you're put like, back in. Yeah. You're you're like Cipher, like a week before he betrayed everyone, yeah. because he's like mm-hmm. he, because Cipher's conscious of what he's doing, but you're like almost like it's almost to the point where you're like you're like you can get out of the matrix and he's like uh no i'm good i'm i'm gonna stay here it's this is what makes sense to me this is where the salvation is and like i'll say this like how we deal with sickness i was i've been listening to um on sickness and suffering by um Mm -hmm. elder ephraim of arizona Mm -hmm. and this thought this had never ever even occurred to me i've heard the quote that i can't remember forgive me which saint came back and she's like if i had known what i was gonna yeah yeah Yeah. so saint ephraim kind of builds on that a little bit and he's like there'll be people in heaven wishing they had suffered more Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. like where Mm -hmm. is that he says abraham he says abraham will wish Mm -hmm. they had suffered more Mm -hmm. and so that that's a completely different paradigm and that's that's what i'm trying to get at is underneath all that is a is an aspect of dishonesty yeah, because, because you have now two, two. I mean, yeah, two antithetical um, perspectives, right? "Quote unquote," they're both under the "quote unquote" umbrella of orthodox. But like to me, this is where you start getting to the wheat and the chaff. You know what I mean? Like the person who seeks to keep his life will 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 lose it, but mm. the person who seeks to who will lose his life for my sake will 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 regain it. Will gain it. You know, and so. Uh, this willingness to be like, hey man, I'm all in. Like, push the chips in. I'm all in. There is no, you know, kind of like uh, escape out the back. It, it, it is what it is, you know? And you see that really quick where things came up. I mean, look, I, I hate to say it, but I'm sure we will all get another <laughs> another run at it because, mm-hmm. you know, the the this this whole thing of sickness and the way that we have all been conditioned to um to nyquil it out not just to nyquil it out not just to nyquil it out but to see it sep- as something separate from god oh. well we're vic- we're victimized by it this is this oh. is what this is what like they talk about victims of victims of covid right that mm. people were victims victims of a victim a victim of a virus like that doesn't even make sense mm. that's like that that's an absurd <laughs> as though statement the vi- as though the victim. virus were some like <laughs> yeah this is well well and and the, and so the and this is this is one of the things that very early on like because a lot of my interest i mean a lot of my introduction to like eastern thought was certainly in the realm of like healing right so so a lot of it was in the in, in, on the healing side and this was even true in my experience with psychedelia and ayahuasca it's you know considered to be a medicine and it's like how is it a medicine right it's like what well what are you t- what are they saying like what's being said when people talk about like plant medicine like what is what is this issue about a medicine and really what it is is it's like the agency the agency of your illness and it's not just like an illness like let's say alcoholism Right. Which would be accepted in the ancient world as like equal to illness. Right. A possession would be equal to, you know, an illness like a a, a healing or an evacuation of demons, uh, you know, an exorcism. They're going to be on the same sort of uh, same plane of things. Right. And so the idea is that it's like you have agency. Are you sick right now? Okay, How did you get sick? Right. And it's not that somebody else gave it to you. Right. It's like, let's take it. This is an opportunity for me to look at, well, what's my diet look like? Well, what, well, what does my activities look like? Well, how am I sleeping? Like all of these things. And then while I'm sick to take this really heavy proactive. So like people, people know me, like I'm somebody, when I start to feel sick a little bit, I have an insane regimen. Right. And I give it to my family. I give it to my herbs and this and that. And some of it is just about intent. I know that it's about intent. That like it's a placebo, like a placebo, but it's like, how do you initiate the placebo? Right. How do you initiate it? And in some ways, it's like, this is it. It's intent. Like, 
This, but but isn't that the same thing with a procession, right? Is that it's like, if I'm oriented in this way, if I have intent, if I'm looking at Christ, if I'm looking toward healing, if I'm seeking him, aren't I more likely to find him? I think that isn't, Father, wouldn't that kind of tie a little bit more in, like into like our thoughts determine our lives? Like, yeah. And so like, look, let's just kind of throw this out there now just to kind of keep everybody from getting scandalized. Like, the problem with any, so like this is getting kind of new age or whatever. Let's just be very clear about something. Um, the problem with any of those things is that they will lead you on a path that ultimately will be autonomous and out and out and try to do something outside of Christ. Yeah. But, yes. No, yes. No, no doubt. And, and so that everybody so, knows I'm, I'm referencing an old, uh, I'm referencing a, a path yeah, to this, right? I'm but, not saying but, this is the path. But that being said, there's truth to those things for a reason, because those processes is how God's designed the cosmos, right? So right. there's a principle at play. There's a principle, there's a principle there that's principle God's play. principle, and people can exploit it. The demons exploit. The, look, there's nothing like what else can you exploit? God's created everything. Like every principle that exists in the co in the created cosmos, right, which includes the spiritual realm, by the way. Mm -hmm. The spiritual realms created everybody, just so you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, God alone is uncreated. But the spiritual realm in which, you know, the demons and the angels exist, like, God created that, too. So all the principles that govern the cosmos, right, the visible and the invisible, right, like, gets us back to the creed. I believe one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. The governor of those principles is God, right? And those things can be exploited. You know, that's kind of like Christian cosmology 101, right? So that's why when people go, you know, oh, no, like that can't really happen. Well, no, it like healings can happen outside of the Christian tradition because all that's happening is they're exploiting a principle that God's put into play. Sure. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. That doesn't healing doesn't mean that it's from Christ. See, this is another thing, right? St. John Maximovich, he healed that Jewish woman, and she wanted to be Orthodox. He's like, ah, that's not a reason to be Orthodox, you know? He's <laughs> like, he healed her. It's like, you know, Christ is generous. Like, we should come to Christ because of repentance and these things, not just like a mercenary. But anyways, point being that I want to get at is it's, it's important that we, that we understand this so we can go further in the conversation without people getting too twisted. Because it is our thoughts that determine our lives, but it isn't the law of attraction, right? Mm. Like, Mm -hmm. And when Christ says it's not magic, it's not magic. And orientation isn't the magic. same as magic practice. Right. right. Yeah. And it's like when Christ says your faith has made you well, your faith has healed you. Okay. Like, well, what's behind that? Right. There's, there's something behind that. And what happens is we need to also on top of that, look at how we see again, it's just the fruit of us being in this, it's the dichotomies, right? The, the materialist dichotomies that we're existing in, where we think that there's nothing spiritual behind diet. Absolutely, there's something spiritual behind diet. How you approach the material world that God created is a spiritual principle. I mean, we are right? in Lent. We're in Lent right now. I we're mean, in Lent, right? I it's mean, the, the Eucharist is eaten. The Eucharist yeah. is eaten. <laughs> and so obviously it matters right and so the thing is is like i've probably talked about this before but you know if i'm i i know i brought this up before but it's we'll bring it up again if i'm a diabetic or i'm pre diet or i'm i'm a pre-diabetic um and i just choose to not care for it and just eat how i want to eat and allow that diabetes to go further that's a spiritual principle right so someone's like, so are now you saying we don't need doctors? What I'm saying is, let us go to the Lord first. Let us pray. Let us do the things that the church has given to us, which includes blessing the doctors and the physicians that God has given wisdom to. Because the church is very clear on that, too. God has given wisdom to physicians to heal. But let's talk about St. Luke the surgeon. St. Yeah. Luke the surgeon, right? He's like, yeah, you know, I mean, he is a surgeon, cutting edge eye doctor, eye surgeon, right? What's he talking about? Like people should drink holy water. Now people, sh you know, he he refused to make have operations without a icon okay. of the Panagia. You know, so it's like it, it isn't either or; it's both and. That's the orthodox 
approach, right? It's that our illness has a spiritual aspect to it. Does that mean it's always because of your sin? No. Is it always spiritual? Yes. Because even if it's not for your direct sin, like quote unquote, your moral infraction, it is there to maybe perhaps engender um, perseverance or or repentance or you see what I'm saying? It's there for some sort of spiritual purpose, right? So it isn't about like where the charismatics, the Protestant charismatics go wrong. They go way far to the left. And it's like they, if you could quote unquote, over spiritualize it to where they divorce it from the incarnate experience. It's incarnational. Illness is an incarnational reality. But then there's the other people and a lot of Orthodox folk will find themselves in this camp because they're so scared of looking like a fundy. They're so, they're so scared of looking like a snake handler or charismatic or they like, oh, that's that village backwards orthodoxy. We are the orthodoxy of the academy, blah, blah, blah. And they will, they will be materialists and yeah. they're going to act like, you know, there isn't a spiritual principle behind these things. So we need to find, you know, forget the royal path, mo- royal path moment, but that's, clearly one right there you know well, I mean, it seems crazy to me though like so much of this materialism it's it's so absurd because and this always stops people whenever i i talk to them about the tradition and i'm like look how does something how do people continue doing something for thousands of years mm-hmm. if it doesn't work right people aren't stupid <laughs> like billions of people I mean, they are now. across thousands of years decide to do something that isn't because it failed. Mm-hmm. Like the and the people like people a thousand years ago didn't have time to do things that failed. They didn't have the luxury like we have to get things wrong because they were yeah. on the they were living oh, on the precipice of death at every moment. Yeah. Like everything that they did had to be right. And so the fact that something that ha- something could last a thousand years and these people chose it for moments that were life and death moments, this is what they chose to do. And you're just going to disregard that. It doesn't. It's absurd. Mm-hmm. It's the dumbest thing that someone could possibly do. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of those things that great example in a kind of a positive light of it is um. One of the brothers turned me on. He found this really great. It's just, it's a very interesting thing. Very interesting podcast um, uh, where this, this doctor is talking about, you know, um, specifically Chinese medicine and really the, the way that it is profoundly, you know, complementary to a Orthodox worldview, you know, he's Orthodox as well. And this is just blowing my mind because the approach to it was, you know, it's just one of those things where someone makes the mistake of um, they assume like Western medicine would be would tend to have a more, quote unquote, formal Christian um, kind of veneer. But it's further from an orthodox perspective, like even though, you know, this Chinese medicine is it's more Taoist, it's not necessarily it's not Christian. It's way more in line in the way that it approaches the the whole the whole organism of man, spirit and body, right? Versus Western medicine, which is the West is whatever quote unquote is supposed to be Christian, but it's it's not. It doesn't look at the body from a Christian perspective, right? It doesn't look at the whole of the soul and the body, right? Well, it doesn't so, even see the body as an integrated whole. It, like no. Western med because they're gonna give you a thing, oh, your hip hurts. Okay, we're gonna do something for your hip. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. Right. Where, whereas the Chinese medicine will be like, eh, but you walk on your like, how are your shoulders aligned? Mm-hmm. What's going on with your level of hydration? Mm-hmm. Right. Like what's going because that's gonna that's gonna affect what happens with this part of your body. Like what happens over here affects what happens over here. Western, we don't Western medicine doesn't do that. But see the Western the Western perspective is again talked about this before too vivisection right Mm -hmm. if you want to know how to what a tree is cut the tree down count the rings tear the tree apart right because having it pulled apart in categories it gives you mastery because if i can destroy if i can kill it i'm its master right what's the eastern way well plant the tree 
live under the tree, eat the tree's yes, fruit, yes, have your yes, child yes. build a swing in the tree, get married yes. in the tree, right? You live with the tree, you know the tree, right? And that mindset is much more in line with how the Orthodox worldview of creation and really of, of, of the cosmos is, right? And and we know this because, look, you know, the, the West, the Western perspective and it's just hard because it's there's there's valuable things to to it. I mean, obviously, but the Western perspective really is a perspective, and it's a worldview that's sold out to a sensual demonic wisdom. Yeah, right? because it's all about mastery. It's all about control. And and think about it this way: everything is about you know, um, everything is about avoiding death in the sense that. We will go to any lengths, even if it means the destruction of the body, kind of in a weird paradoxical way or a weird contradictory way, or or destruction of the mind of the soul to avoid quote unquote like death. We'll we will sacrifice everything, our integrity, we'll sacrifice our ethics, we'll sacrifice our religion. That's what happened in 20 to avoid death, right? But that's actually suicide. <laughs> So like we're committing suicide it, thinking that Christ we're avoiding it, death. Absolutely. <laughs> so absolutely. this is interesting because um because of the nature of some of the stuff that's happening in my work, we are uh, there's just a greater emphasis on uh acceptance of medically assisted treatment. Mm -hmm. And I don't care, I'll die on this hill too, 100 percent Um, this is an opinion I have no problem <laughs> arguing with people about. But medically assisted treatment involves getting on things so like they're not even offering it just to opiate addicts anymore. But it's this idea of giving this drug called Suboxone is the big one to people. And it's essentially just like legal heroin. It's just government heroin. Um, I, I'll die on that hill. I see people nod off on it. I see people do the classic people suffer from constipation, bloating, all the classic symptoms of being on good dope. Um, so super anti-suboxone oh i will i am that is my whole thing if i can get that written on my grave is that suboxone sucks i would get that written on my grave um but it's under this umbrella called medically assisted treatment or in the umbrella under that is called harm reduction harm reduction policies are things like needle exchanges safe using spots um you know i i struggled to think of another example but so this is interesting Someone correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe I'm wrong, but we're talking about, essentially, if I'm hearing you guys right, vivisection is much more about treating the symptoms of the problem, not the underlying cause, because the Western world is not willing to admit that the underlying cause exists, that there is no central core in the middle that these problems might stem from, from a spiritual life. Okay, so... Harm reduction is well, well, Andrew, be because it, it, it's if you admit that there's a central cause, mm -hmm. then that necessarily means that you have to dig as deep as it goes. So this which is necessarily means that you end up at a spiritual cause. So this is the point. That's yes. Yeah, I agree with you. That that's the point. The point is, is that. As of late, let me pause real quick. Let me just say this one thing too. forgive me. Super important. Just so we're clear, though, it isn't just enough to acknowledge a spiritual cause because we're moving into a time where there's going to be lots of people who are going to get on board with this. But here's here's going to be the separation. Repentance, Christ, God, because if you dig down deep enough, right, it's not just enough like to find that there's a spiritual component because everyone will be like, OK, cool. That sounds good. Right? I'm spiritual. I'm just not religious. Right. Sure. You go down deep enough, there's going to be a concession of, oh, there's a creator. Oh, that creator isn't an impersonal force. Oh, that creator actually yes. has standards and has this this creator's truth. Oh, I have to now concede to that truth. That's the problem. That That's, that, that's fundamentally. And so repentance is going to be the repentance is going to where it's going to separate everybody. Right? So that that's 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 what i'm trying to get to and thank you father because that's that's where i'm trying to get to is it's not even just acknowledging the fact that like oh well there might be some stuff going on here that i'm not seeing or whatever blah 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 if if i'm to 
my experience in recovery has taught me is, is that long-standing recovery comes from repentance. Mm-hmm. It comes from the ability to change your mind mm-hmm. is change and to be able to not only stop the thing that you're doing, but turn around and replace it with something good and start heading the other direction. Mm-hmm. So, so it's interesting. I could be wrong. We have this nice little Petri dish now of what harm reduction looks like on a mass scale. And it is Portland, Oregon. Because mm. Portland, Oregon has now, and from what I understand, decriminalized it's a hellscape. hellscape. De- decriminalized all drug use, from what I understand. And I could be wrong. So that means you could bang heroin on the side of the road next to a police officer, and they're not going to stop you, from what I understand. So all of this is falling under this term of harm reduction. So we are treating the symptoms of addiction such as quote unquote getting rid of the cravings through suboxone use which is basically just keep them high like don't worry about and they're not just giving it to opiate people anymore it's anybody suffering from any addiction and like not only that someone can go in and i've seen it so many times like i can't tell you how many times i've seen it. somebody will be sober for 11 months and they will go into a doctor pharmacia a doctor will prescribe them suboxone they have no cravings They are long since they are on their way to healthy recovery, and instead they get hooked on government heroin. And I've seen it multiple, multiple times. And not only that, doctors encourage you to up the dose if you're still feeling uncomfortable. Like, keep going, keep going up. There's There's a hit, there's a roof, there's a ceiling, and you haven't hit it yet. That's insane. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's the bane of the recovery world right now. And it's, um... One of those, if a recovery center is wanting to get to a certain echelon, as we were to say, get to a certain point, you got to get your 30 pieces of silver at some point. You got to really start being like, okay, I don't know if we can say faith centered, let's say spiritual centered instead. Like, uh, you guys only accept Christians? Well, if you want this funding, then we got to we got to maybe include some other people in there after all the christian religion has been so oppressive it's certainly anti-feminist anti-lgbt we we can't really we us as a company hey we got the check right here but we're not going to give it to you cuz we can't be seen doing business with a christian organization you guys can still be all about jesus that's fine that's fine but you got to accept other people too and by the way you guys have to accept medically assisted treatment people, medically assisted treat, medically assisted treatment people, and you cannot shame them or make them feel weird for them being in recovery and nodding off in their recovery class and falling asleep and itching. Yeah, and how how is that? Them. That doesn't sound like recovery. To me. So this is interesting. And I promise I'll get off my high horse in just one second. But actually, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health, blah, 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 blah like 2017 or 2018 came up with their definition of recovery mind you samsa is the marriage of the recovery field and the medical field right so we now need data we need hard facts we need proven methods that lie outside of the of christianity of the christian god it can be spiritual but it just can't be repentance. We can't talk about digging too deep. Let's keep everything nice and superficial. And we and this is now recovery. And in their definition of recovery, never once is abstinence mentioned. Mm. You can be in recovery and smoking pot, have down to two beers a day instead of 10. You can be, you know, participating in orgies. You can be going and picking up prostitutes. None of that stuff has anything to do quote unquote with recovery anymore so all this is my very very long-winded say a way of saying as far as the recovery field goes it's now much more about treating the symptoms instead of underlooking like cyprian said well like well how's your water intake what's your hips like okay well are you mad at your parents like what's going on have you talked to your brother the brother that you cussed out at his wedding you know like have you because that's the true recovery the true mm-hmm. recovery isn't the substance. Well, why'd yeah. you start doing the substance? In the exactly. First place? Exactly. You know what I mean? And that's so interesting because I can't get people a lot of the times to say why. It's like I talked to this guy just the other day, and he was I was like, he's like, Well, I don't need treatment. I was like, Okay, didn't you just admit to smoking methamphetamines like three days ago? 
And he's like, yeah, but I'm not addicted. I'm like, but do you see most normal people? That's never even an option. Mm -hmm. That's like methamphetamine is never even an option. It's like, no matter how tired you are, it doesn't even cross your mind. The fact that it not only crossed your mind, but you went out and got it, you ingested the substance, and then you did that three days ago, and you're still homeless. See, let me let me just take a moment right here and say, I don't know. I'm just going to jump in real quick and say, people don't even know how bad this is. And what I mean by that is this. Sickness is a gift, just like death. Death is a gift in the sense that it's a call to repentance. It's like sickness for many people it's the one thing that might save their soul and so of i don't know if you guys are for many this. for many for yeah. many people so when you neuter that when you take that component out and just make sickness not only something that's just like hey it happens just an exclusively materialist you know material natural like phenomena when you take out that the real bite of it the call to repentance of it, man, you really are giving people a rocket trip to hell, right? Because it's like, that's the whole thing of like, uh, it is, it is the road to hell being gilded with gold and just like, yeah, no problem. Like the pain of sickness, the call to, the call to coming to yourself like the prodigal son. That's the point of sickness. Sickness is given to us so we can wake up and repent, so we can wake up and 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 turn, so that we could, the pain is there to cause us to experience purification. And well, to, this is and, rock bottom, right? This is what a crisis, yeah. this is the reason that this is like cri but crises, you, but right? You, it, if, yeah. Right, if you, it's kind of like you take the medicine out of the medicine and just give them the sugary, gross grape taste. Mm. it's like here's the here's the sugary gross because medicine taste. is supposed to taste bad i'm sorry that's that, sorry that's it so i i just think it's for me that's a huge thing that's a huge thing it, it's kind of like forgive me it, it's kind of like the whole thing when um like you know with just like woke stuff and and work and it's just like look you know, a community, a, a, a community that doesn't work, a man who doesn't work, right? Like <laughs> anything that moves people to get out of work is evil. Not because of some capitalist purview, but because work is a penance. Like you working and and the earth not not giving its fruit freely to you and, and producing thorns and thistles like like the curse is a penance that penance is there to bring us to repentance are, are you following what i'm saying so anything you know ubi right ubi to me is just one further extension of suboxone which is one further extension of hey it's not your fault you have this mental health issue you like you just caught it like the common cold right mm -hmm. we won't look at all these things that are that have been happening in your life we won't look at well, them. well well father ubi will be spent on drugs yeah like it sure. is like it's we know we sure. know we know this if you give sure. people money for some sure. huge percentage of that goes to drugs that for doesn't sure. go to drugs if they worked for it for sure for sure and it's just kind of like i told and the story before too you know when i got here to Kansas City in 2015, the dear brother asked me, he said, what's success going to look like? You know, because working here on the east side and this and that. I said, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it's going to look like, right? And then he came back and he asked me again. And I said, I still don't know what success, quote unquote, looks like, but I know it's not giving people middle class affect. And it isn't about trying to, because I, I still maintain this. You can, the work, the worst things you can do, and that's that's what so many nonprofits and these do-gooder, you know, forgive me for getting all cynical um, organizations do is they think that dumping money, right? Uh, just dumping money is gonna, like that's the worst thing you can do, and then is just dump a bunch of money, right? Because not only will things not get better, they'll get worse. It gets there's right? nothing. Worse. There's nothing. 
you know, people should, it's been interesting living here, right? In CNMI, because like the people who are here, like the Chamorros have been here for 3000 years, right? So that's a long time for a people to be here, but they've been getting money dumped on them by the U.S. federal government in this very interesting and beneficial relationship that they have with the U.S. federal government for a long time. And one of the things they own all the land here. Right. Nobody but Chamorros and Carolinians, the locals, can even own the land. And they were farmers for thousands of years. Very successfully, by the way, everything grows here. They all have agricultural backgrounds, even just they, they know how. You know what? Nobody farms anymore. Nobody yeah. farms anymore here. And, and like there's like comparatively because everybody here uh, has farms. They all have hyper productive farmland and it all sits fallow and the jungle. The jungle has overtaken it. Right. They all own they, they own hectares and hundreds of hectares of land. And it's all hyper productive. Right. Why? Because the f federal government just dumps money on. Them. What? Why? 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 Why should we work? Mm -hmm. there was so the a... whole the whole culture here is farming grants, farming federal grants. It's not farming their own land. Some of the most productive land in the world. No, I mean, no, no, no. We're going to farm grants. It just it kills me because it, it's it's becoming more and more apparent. You know, it's like. In the last days, they will call what is good evil and what is evil good. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and everything is about, because look, it's the devil. The devil's conditioning people, and he's he's that pusher man. He's like, hey, I'll give you everything you want. What do you want? I'll give it to you. And then God is the big baddie who's like, listen. You can't have heroin. You, this is, this is going to kill you. <laughs> hey, listen, you know, it is not healthy and good. I don't care what you say. Your alphabet soup lifestyle, you're not happy. You aren't happy, right? And so all of these things, God is... I've a, never met a happy alph alphabet I soup. You're not, not going either. to. You're not going to. Never. Not you're either. not going to. This gets you back to our first episode of The Father. And it all comes full circle to everything's about conditioning on a deep, deep spiritual level, the hatred of the Father. Mm. right kill the father in the family system kill the father in culture kill the family and kill the father in entertainment because ultimately the father is that symbol of the heavenly father and the fallen ones are just trying to engender the hatred of the father on every level whether it's starting the, the easiest one the the physiological the material like hey you know the father's keeping you you know and what are the however the father manifests and represents to people whether it's you know the priest your dad structure authority basically saying no to you saying like no discipline right no like unwanted pleasure and just whatever you want is not good the devil tells you whatever you want is good and you can have as much of it as you want. It's and, like but getting father, mad father, there's also the flip side, right? Like, because I think this is the thing that people don't don't see and understand. Um, and, and also it gets back to this idea of just giving you what you want is protection. Like the father, yes, he's saying no. But one of the things that you know is that so long as you stay inside that box, he's going to like tooth and nail He'll 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 give everything of and he himself actually will to keep protect you. He he will actually keep you safe. Whereas the other guy is like, oh, here, have all of this. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And it's poison. Like, it's not just that he, you won't be kept safe. It's that you'll be fed poison. Mm -hmm. That's sweet, mm -hmm. sweet poison. It's that rat poison. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Rat poison is sweet. Rat, mm -hmm. like, rats love love rats love rat poison mm -hmm. i um uh, it's like getting mad at a personal trainer it's like if you got a personal trainer and you went out and you're like i have diabetes i'd like to do something about it personal trainer's like okay let's do something then you get mad at them when they say no you can't kill six donuts just like sit down and smash six donuts like you can't do that like that's not good for you and then you're like well you're so mean it's right. like, oh, I don't think I am being to the life of a priest. Well, there's the, there's the guy, and and it's funny because this is this is it's it's almost it's a meme. It's it's a meme that goes to this, but I'm sure you guys have seen this. It's the 
this big, this yoked, super yoked black dude. He's always got oh, yeah. no shirt on and he walks like this. And he's <laughs> like the guys who he's training and he'll walk. He'll see uh, he's in that McDonald's and he walks in and he slaps yeah, the burger. Dude, out of yeah. front of his yeah. hand. And it's like, that's it. Yeah. It's like that. And the guy, and the guy's like freaked out. And he's scared. And he's like, get that burger out of your hands. And it's like, yes, that's it right there. You know, yeah. that's it. And, and there's, there, there has to be that severity, you know, there has to be that, like, I don't do subtle. Fear. Too, bro. Yeah. I don't well, do. The, there, there has to, there has to be that you have to have fear of your father. Yeah. But, but at the same time, like it's, my kids said this and it was really interesting. Like, like I, my, my kids, they, they relish time with me. You know what I mean? And it's like, I'm getting to know that more and more as they, as they get older and they can express it to me. But like my seven year old, you know, I picked her up from school. I don't usually it's usually her mom and her sister and she loves her mom the same way. But when I go and pick her up, she's like, oh, when you're not busy with work on days when you're not busy with work, can you pick me up from school? I just and her eyes when she sees me and it's me that shows up at the gate for her to get her. Ah, oh, she just it's like, ah, Papa's here. Like it's that. But at the same time, there was a, an interesting little exchange that that. You know, where my daughters, I don't understand. I don't know what the context was, but they were describing me something. And they were like, yeah, you know, he's describing dad. And it was like, he's big and scary. And I was like, big and scary. And I was like, huh. It really threw me threw me for a loop because I was like, oh, I'm. Huh. And, and that interesting paradox, right, mm -hmm. of like, oh, my dad is big and scary. But at the same time, he's exactly the person that I want to see. Mm -hmm. yeah and that's like that's the father that that's the I, father i find that people actually most men to a degree i'm not a priest so i'm i deal with things in a very superficial level but i find most men actually respond really well to that i counsel it's like no that is your fault you did do that wrong like everyone else is trying to pacify you mm -hmm. everyone else is trying to tell you like you don't need to feel weird about this thing. You don't need to feel weird about cussing out your brother at your wedding. You know, you were a victim of your alcoholism. And it's like, no, what you did was wrong. And the fact that you feel weird about it means you're still alive and you should be grateful for that. Because the only thing scarier than this feeling that you feel right now is feeling nothing at all. Because ultimately, that's the goal. That's the goal of your addiction is get to you a point where like your conscience is so numbed that there you don't you don't respond to the the correction correctly you oh don't... that's an important point that's a th i think that's a point that a lot of people don't think about with what is what are people trying to do with their addiction i mean we talk about it like oh numb the pain and everything but i think to really like that it's that that's not a metaphor no like it's literally it's like um like your conscience is so bad it hurts so bad it, it becomes physical it starts to hurt physically um i have a shoulder injury and i didn't never played sports i've never played sports a day in my life it's from tension it's from me being like this all the time like it's my penance i've asked god to take it away from me and it's not been taken away from me it's my penance like i did not feel right because i wasn't doing right things like i felt off and weird and in pain and when you get to the point where that where your conscious doesn't seem to be playing it's like sometimes in prayer i'll be praying really hard and i'll be praying really earnestly and i'll kind of be like ignoring these parts of like my life and my soul and then like when i finally like it's like maybe like 10 minutes in and the prayers felt kind of rushed and dry i'll start to think of it like what's going on and I'll be like oh you ate that donut today you remember that and then like i feel the tension leave my body i'm like i don't know if i'm using the right words but it's like i'm trying to present just one part of myself to god like i'm just like trying to put on this one part it's like one third of andrew or something like that and i'm trying to sit there and act like this prayer it i'm trying to get through prayer without feeling anything i'm trying to get through prayer without like i know what you're talking the, about the difficulty I'm trying to just get through, get through the motions and, and not even that I'm not even admitting that I'm doing that. 
But when I admit it, then like I like literally like my back on flexes, like my shoulders slump a little bit. Like I just realized how tight I was. And you, there are people who live their lives like that that they are constantly like needing to be. And I use the term Instagram ready. Well, I think, I think a lot more people, I don't, I mean, you couch it more in this. It should be couched more like most people might live their life like that because mm. this gets you back to this. I mean, it's, it's primordial in the sense of being cast out from the garden. Yeah. I was about to say it's Adam hiding from, it's, from it's, God as he's walking Adam through the garden and yeah. taking the, the, taking the garments of, of skin. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is not, you know, it, it's it's our materiality and hiding behind that. The gardens, the, the garments of skin <clears throat> is the materiality in which we hide behind, which that's the emphasis now. You know, everything's flipped where it's it's, you know, body, the, the body is leading the way. Right. And so we hide behind the coarseness of the flesh and it keeps us from, you know, being exposed to the light in a certain way. Well, at least we think it does, but God sees through it all and God in his mercy, you know, he hangs back and he gently calls us to him, but ultimately we're hiding behind those, the fig leaves, the, the garments of skin, because we don't want to be exposed. And, and so the body will do these things like you just literally being tense or, or um, shooting and firing off, certain chemicals to keep thoughts going you know what i mean like all of those things are part of the avoidance of of encountering god and that's why you know the the tradition teaches that hesekia stillness is the method and the means of healing the soul you heal the soul you'll heal the mind you heal the mind then you will begin to move the body into a place of healing which all that means is integration to where Mm. the body, the spirit and the soul is integrated as God has intended it and is moving in a forward positive trajectory towards Christ. Right. And that's theosis. Right. And that's how you get healed of illness, body and in soul. Right. And it starts Mm. with learning to read it, learning to read what's going on with you. And that's the source of everyone's addictions, you know, that's the source of the person, you know, having the compulsory sexual act, the self-abuse, the overeating, the overdrinking, you know, the lying, um, all those things are compulsory movements to avoid the exposure to God, you know? Well, we, we talk about orientation and now this the what what I'm getting more from this is, and this is the first time that I've actually really thought about it this way, but it's it it really slams it home, is like orientation, of course, which way are we facing, which way are we heading? But it's not just that, it's also posture. Right? It's also what you talk about the alignment, right? Like all of these, so we're talking about a spiritual posture, right? Because posture is all about alignment. That's fundamentally what and if your posture is off, then things start to Mm-hmm. Nerves start to pinch. This starts to go. This gets weak over here. Yeah. And then it affects the whole thing. Right. Yeah. So it's like facing the right way and in in a po- in the right posture, the right pose. And again, it's like, well, that's throughout the tradition, too. Well, right? posture, our, pra- our practice po- well, posture is everything. Posture isn't just to be taken exclusively as as a physical expression, although it is. Right. And this is why Orthodox understand this. Like you shouldn't be standing in church with your hands in your pocket. You know what I mean? Like For real. Posture, just... posture communicates something, right? And so posture, posture is a, the physical posture is also the spiritual posture. You know, I've seen, like, I've seen people go into their first service, <clears throat> hands in pockets, and by the end, they're assuming the like the, mm-hmm. the you know hands and clasped in front of you kind of thing. And like, I wonder if there's a yeah. Difference. And why? Why does why? The, what's interesting is like the falling into that. Right. Because it's I, like, like, it's I, like I, talk- I fell into that. Like, Father, when you guys came and there was no, but no, that happened to me. Oh, and that's so weird. Because even on my first time in an Orthodox church, which was my daughter's, ba- which was my, my oldest daughter's baptism, by the end, I was in that posture and there were no other Orthodox people in there except for my wife and her friends who were holding the baby. Mm-hmm. You know yeah, what Father- I mean? talked about that in his tattoo shop people would cuss in front of icons and be oh sorry like 
Like they they never even realized like these are pagans, atheists, and there's witches. icons up in his shop yeah. and witches and they would they would be cussing and they look at and be, oh sorry. And father's like, well, I didn't say anything. Like I they're responding to the holiness. You're responding to the holiness. Like but, but just, we respond the same way. I think that's the thing that I'm trying to get. Well, this, yes, these are because, the things that tell me it's real. Because it's Adamic. It's the Adamic right. fault. And think right. of it this way, too. Also think of it like this, right? If you are inflamed, you know, like, you know, like guys in combat sports or sports, like a big thing, like the ice bath. Why do you do the ice bath? Mm -hmm. Ice bath is to reduce inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you've ever taken an ice bath or cold shower, it's rough. You know what I mean? And you tense yeah. up. It's a thing. Yep. But eventually what happens, what? You begin to acclimate to it. Mm -hmm. And that acclimation is the process of the healing. You relax, right? And you allow it to come and do what it needs to do. Hot shower, same thing. Ooh, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you eventually acclimate and you the heat, you allow the heat to come and do what it needs to do. The, the point I'm trying to get at is, you enter into that space of holiness. And this is what happens. Listen, we, people have talked about this where there's, you know, anyone who begins to start a practice of saying the prayer, everyone knows if, if you, if you do have that practice, everyone knows the stage uh, which stays there for a long time of having the, the aversion to the prayer. Yeah. It's like, ah, you know, it's like, ah, you know, it's like you find procrastination all these things begin to happen and it's like that aversion to it is a really good sign. Mm. I, I would almost say to someone, if you haven't had that level of, a, of having aversion to saying the prayer, the Jesus prayer, maybe you need to talk with your priest and have it adjusted a little bit because that aversion is a sign of actual encounter, right? That's Cause it's, un cause it's uncomfortable. Yeah, nobody's nobody's jumping in the game fresh from the fresh, like, let's do this. Everyone's going to have this encounter of the aversion to the prayer. Because if you're actually encountering Christ, you're actually encountering the stillness, it's rough. It's rough. And that's why yeah. you procrastinate. That's why those things come. All the thoughts and the logos me, quote unquote, they're not always the demons hitting you. A lot of it is you tensing up psychologically a lot of it is you tensing up spiritually right because there is this aversion that's in us because of the fall of approaching god it's that and that would be like original sin like in the sense of like yes. having the the um prolic uh, or the it's like natural for us to choose things away from god right the proclivity like, towards the bad towards yeah. towards uh, away from god yeah. right so not original sin in the sense of inheriting sure. Adam's quote unquote guilt, like, but you are inheriting the consequences and you are inheriting certain aspects of approach, behavior, understanding. You know what I mean? So it's really key. It's it's really key because it's something that um if you get this and you understand that it isn't just you on a hyper individualistic level that actually is a really great way to make, take a step forward spiritually. One way I, I try to explain it is you want to make your cross kind of broader, if that makes sense. So the process that I try to walk people through in regards of, you know, repentance and moving into this place of, you know, if God allows illumination and, and growth is that there's this space where everyone's working on their issues. That is hyper individualistic, but you don't want to stay there forever. You don't want to stay there just talking about Andrew's stuff and how you hated, you know, your cousin for what he did, and like all those things. Like you don't want to, you don't want to do that. You want to, you want to address it. You want to get to the place. It's like working out a knot. You want, you want to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart. You want to allow the Father to bring you the circumstances to where you humble yourself down. But humbling down is the relaxing. Yeah. So you, so you can allow the knot to get yeah. worked out. There it is. And there then is. and then once the knot gets worked out, then you can actually start getting into some core training, some strengthening. And, and what that looks like is, okay, yeah, you know, Johnny is a sinner and Johnny's done this and Johnny was not nice to his mom. But then Johnny begins to realize, but I'm a Ferguson. 
oh, and not only am I a Ferguson, but I'm a man. And I'm a Western man, you know what I mean? And that cross gets broader. You begin to now realize how you share this burden of sin with humanity, with other people. And this is where the monastics talk about, you know, praying for the world, suffering with the world. This is in many ways what Peter talks about in his epistle about, you know, finding encouragement that we, our brothers, our brethren suffers like suffer with us and like us. It makes the cross broader. It, It gives you more of a plane so that the narrowness isn't just, it, it, that you understand the analogy you're making. It's like the more narrow and the more focused the beam is on you, the more acute and painful it is. Making it a bit more broader, you can distribute the weight. Sure. So by allowing those bigger categories, this is one of the core things with my marriage counseling with people is trying to get them to understand. It's like, uh, you remember this, you know, we talked about it. It's like, hey, there's going to be issues with like, just because you are a human being, and then there's going to be issues because you're a man or a woman. And then there's going to be issues even with because you're Johnny. And there's going to be issues because now you're Porfirios. You know what I mean? And it's like some those things all overlap. You know what I mean? But the modern man, we're so fragmented. We're so fragmented now that getting people to understand, it's like you're dealing with a lot of layers. And sometimes, you know, Johnny's acting out because he isn't being Porfirios. You know what I mean? He isn't leaning mm-hmm. into the baptized man who needs to be repenting. You know what I mean? He's still the 15 year old kid who wants to, you know, smoke a bunch of dope and do whatever. You, you know the what old, I mean? The old man is kicking. The old, the man, old man is man. kicking. Yeah. So you have um, to broaden that cross and, and bring it all in together. I just want to say this really quick. I have one cousin and he's a listener and I've never been mad at him. I love cousin Brian. Oh, and so man. I've never actually had a problem with him. Um, and then two, like, uh, that would be like, so I forget, I think it was my baptizing priest, Father James talked about that, like, that there are times where it's like, you have to drag your wife and sometimes your wife has to drag you. And it's like, and once that, like, you, you, it, it's just like, it's like, sometimes they have to bear the entire cross. And then sometimes you have to bear the entire Christ. And then like getting to a point of like, oh, you both kind of understand your role so you can hold the cross together. Mm-hmm. And then like then that just kind of builds out because you're just like, okay, I can see like on a, on a, on a practical level, like I can see like why me understanding because, Oh man, I'm sorry. I just got touched on this. What you said about, you can only stay in you for so long. Like there's a point where I'm scraping. I'm not scraping the bottom of the barrel because the Lord knows there's still lots of stuff in there, but like, I feel like I'm scraping. And it's like, I'm just so sick of looking at me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm so sick of dissecting this over and over and over again. I don't want to do it anymore. And then like, I, I don't know. I found that. Which gets us, well, that gets us back to talking about sickness too. It's like, and <laughs> excuse me, the approach to sickness, right? And that gets us back to the little victim mentality thing. The victim mentality wants to keep people looking at the wound and yeah. picking at it. Yeah. Pick at it, pick at it, pick at it, pick at it, pick at it. Right. Versus what do I need to do to get this wound to heal? Right. How do I get it to heal? And, and that may have nothing to do with actually touching the wound, treating the wound. It may have to do with something you need to eat. It may have to do with right. you need to some activity you need to do, that's get more sun. It could have to do with all those things. And we see this all. I mean, again, it's it's Elisha and, and Naaman. You know, Naaman comes and you, we talked about this before. Naaman has leprosy and he's like, hey, I'm ready to do anything. I'm ready to go <laughs> conquer 20 kingdoms. They're like, okay, go jump in the Jordan. What? Nah. I'm not jumping in the Jordan. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's beneath me. It's like, you know, like people have, and, and you saw this too, because people wanted to catastrophize, you know, whatever disease, you know what I mean? Whatever virus came, they wanted to catastrophize it. You know what I mean? They want in the way they talked about it and getting back to the victim. Of, I was a victim of it. All those things. It's like, People, many people were never really interested in wanting to be better, wanting, wanting the world to be better. It's, you know what it's like? It's like, uh, I'm trying to think there, there's like that one thing where the, uh, gosh, what movie is that? Where they, the mom keeps the kids sick. Um, flowers in the attic. Was it flowers in the attic? The, the sixth sense. There's a couple of them. 
Yeah, there's a couple more. Like, did you put the poison in there because you want to keep the kids sick? Yeah, because you're because. Oh, uh, with Nicole Kidman, the others. Is it the others? Hey, I'm that's just... a twist ending. That's there's a, twist. a bunch of the, the point yeah. being is yeah. this this movement of you know a lot of people and and the people who are still I mean still doing the mask is they they want to keep the world sick. They yes. want things to stay sick because. For all kinds of twisted, weird reasons. Well, it gave them meaning. I think for a lot of people, it gave them meaning. Uh, one of the one, something interesting. I mean, on that note, is Pete, there was there was this idea that so so here's the thing. Throughout that whole thing, I never got it. I never got it. Never got it. I think it went through my house in February 2020. We were in California, so early hit. I think it went through my house. I was on a seven day fast at the time. Never got it. Never had anything happen, right? And I was also not worried about it. I was totally the whole time. I was like, "How many people? How many people is this killing? Like, what? What percentage? Like, I think even if even if there was something that was like it kills fifty percent of the people. Wait, do fifty percent of the people live? Yes, I would be. I would feel like I'm going to be in the fifty percent. I would just feel that. I would be very confident that I'm going to be in the fifty percent because I'm very rarely sick. I know I have a good immune system. I tank up on all all kind of. I keep my vitamins good and all of that, right? What I found interesting was that people who were like not scared, there was something that it was like, there's something wrong with me because I'm not scared. Why are you not scared? But, but it was, but there was not a question of why are you not scared? Because that would have been a good question to ask, right? Like, oh, here you are. You don't seem like a stupid person. You seem to have some amount of medical and scientific knowledge. Like, why aren't you scared? Why aren't you particularly scared? Like, that would be good information to know. Like, why isn't this person scared? Right. But instead, it was like, you, it's not like, why aren't you scared? Like, I'm curious. It's like, why aren't you scared? Mm. You, ha you have to be scared because yeah. if you're not scared, you're a crazy person. And it's yeah. like, well, turns out, turns out, lo and behold, I had nothing to fear. I actually, the evidence says I had nothing to fear mm -hmm. because I never got it. The numbers were on your side. The numbers. It's like, not even. It's and it, it's not even that. It's just like well, but I was, but but I actually turns out I had nothing to fear. So it's like so me being scared, I would have actually like, hmm, perhaps would me being scared have actually changed the outcome? The yes. people, yeah, no, we saw yes. it. We saw uh, it absolutely right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Father and I saw it on like a on a very personal basis. I'm not putting anyone on blast, but there were several people who were very worried about getting it that we knew hyper hyper scared and they all got it and all meanwhile we were still kissing icons and but taking isn't that the nature of fear mm -hmm. it's like, like when you're riding a bike is, and you see a fear. big you see a big rock and you're really worried about hitting that rock and you're just, like i can't hit that well, rock you're, please you're don't let me hit, hit that rock. and then you end up hitting the rock well you you steer right i, I always i I've, I've had this little maxim that i've that i've told to people about like how i view the difference between fear and love and like, what's going to happen if you because like you see somebody running down the street full speed, right? You know, one of two things. He's either running towards something at full speed or, away or he's running him. away from something at full speed. And it's like, OK, but those are not the same, right? Because it's all again, it's about orientation. Like, where are your eyes? Right. Because if you are running away, if you're running towards something at full speed and there's obstacles in your path, right, you see the obstacles. You mm -hmm. actually see them a long ways away and you have time to deal with them and you adjust and you deal with them and you move forward. If you're running away from something at full speed, your eyes are on the thing you're running away from that you're sure. scared of. You don't see any obstacle. And just like in a horror movie, you trip and fall you trip mm -hmm. and the thing gets you every it's like, that's why it's in a horror movie. That's yeah. why it's in every horror movie, because we recognize that that's a spiritual principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, yo, it's and, and when I when I would have this conversation with people, it would be when people would be like, they would be like, why are you? Because I'm because like th with this principle in mind, I've been someone who was like never afraid of infidelity from my partners. Right. Like somebody I never focus. I, it's like I never focus on it. And people were like, why would you like you're not even the least bit concerned because they would come to me and be like, oh, I, I, I would always worry about my girlfriend or my wife cheating on me or whatever. This is back in the day. Right. And I would and I would say this little thing and I would be like, because you're worried about it, mm -hmm. you're going to lose this person. Mm -hmm. 
it's your insecurity about this that is going to mean the end of your relationship and maybe that they cheat on you. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're guaranteed for it to happen if you keep picking up her phone and trying to go through it putting a tracker on her car, get going through her emails. It's going to happen. But isn't there a way of like harnessing that for good though? I mean, isn't there I a way there's of a like... way of harnessing everything for good? Except, yeah, envy. But... except, except envy, except envy, right? <laughs> oh, <fuck. Except> envy. <laughs> okay. Gentlemen, it's getting late. And, yes. and I, so this is awesome. So I, I'll say this father. I've, I, I didn't get a chance to look up an email, but this question occurred to me. Is giving the metal horns, is that something we shouldn't do? Oh. Like, you know, like the, the typical hand gesture. Buddy, I just answered this. Someone reached out on this. Forgive me, I forget your name if you're listening. <laughs> and I sent them a very, and please forgive me too for the brevity. Anybody, if you write me, and you get, and do not mistake my brevity for being. He is a curt texter. He I'm is. a curt texter. Yeah. I just, you know, I try to. Hey, be... father. Da, 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 da. Yes. <laughs> like hey, like okay good but i i basically i replied to them with a picture of the back wall um, okay that's what struck me about it i was like so is this is something we shouldn't be doing what do you mean the back wall the back wall of what it's a he's an icon he's drawing he's doing the back wall he's uh writing the okay. back wall of the church right now and there's a demon giving the metal horns What's the oh devil? there you go it's okay. the devil with the antichrist the sitting in his lap. the devil with the antichrist in his lap right yeah that's awesome is okay. there a limp wrist thing going on there father there is okay <laughs> so just a definitive let's i should stop doing that because like i, I mean, still i mean i'll put it this way it's like you know, people do whatever because of lexicon. I'm not. I'm not gonna say to you like all of a sudden you're gonna get possessed because you do it. Um, but like it, it's something that we really should just be more. We should be more thoughtful about how we listen. Right. This is. Yeah. This blesses and it and it liberates and it heals and it does right. Okay. Well, what would you consider to be the inverse of that? Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? And so, because I noticed Stephen Strange, that Doctor Strange, does it a lot, and I didn't know if there was something having. Yeah, to do I mean, I love Doctor Strange, but like, you know, it's one of those things where it's there's a reason why he does it. Yeah, you know? yeah no, that's that and that's even, what, and someone's gonna clickety clackety. Well, Ronnie James Dio. That's what I was gonna say. Right, We're supposed, I mean? supposed and, to be and, against the evil eye, wasn't it? And the thing is, is like, you know, it, I'll tell you something. Yeah, but the demons give protection against the evil eye. Absolutely, <laughs> they do. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do. you know, there, there's, you know, I, I know accounts of people who were pushed to leaving faith in Christ by a demon and turning to a demon for that um cessation of what was bothering them that's well, a voodoo thing. it's voodoo it is it is it's voodoo i mean that's it, what voodoo that, is all about literally what voodoo is all about yes. you create the problem mm -hmm. to then provide the solution mm -hmm. the devils are like super i mean that's they invented that game mm -hmm. it's like there's game. an episode of the simpsons where at the end everyone's getting drunk because they had temporarily enacted prohibition in Springfield. And they said, here's the alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of our problems. That's it. That's it right there. The yeah. spirits. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, gentlemen, I got to go to bed. It's it's that time where all I got to right. start getting ready to go to bed. Um, so, uh, again, we, uh, we apologize, but don't apologize for taking two weeks off. This is going to be a reoccurring thing as long as we are doing this podcast is every time we enter a season of fasting, there's a good chance, especially during Lent when there's an increase in service and trials that um, we will need to take a week off. Um, this is certainly going to be the case. Um, uh, but otherwise, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to us at Andrew at RoyalPath.net. Um, Work. Network. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, feel free to reach out to us th through there. A couple of people have reached out in the last couple of days. I haven't got a chance to get back to you because I'm getting over a sickness. Same with the playlist on Spotify. I haven't updated it in probably a month. I am going to get to it. I apologize. Anytime we enter, we mention a song. I'm not going to put Wonderwall on there. 
But anytime Dio, we, like, it's only Wonderwall and Dio were mentioned. Uh, yeah, but I'm not putting Wonderwall on there. I'll put some Dio on there without a doubt. I'll put some Dio on there. Um, but I'm not putting Wonderwall. Anytime we mention a song or an artist, we try to throw some music. I want a playlist on Spotify called Royal Path Playlist, something like that. Podcast playlist, something like that. We have a merch store at um, royalpath.store. All proceeds go to the uh, church, except for a little bit, which goes to the person who makes the merch. And then, um, is there anything else? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, no, I don't. I don't know if that's still open about the family. Please pray for that family we've mentioned before. I don't remember their last name. Um, Porfirios and Zenia. Uh, the husband was involved. Paisios and uh, Zenia. Uh, husband was involved in a car accident. Um, things seem to be on the up and up, but still continue to pray for them, please. Um, and I think. I think, I think, I think that is it. So thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye.